Recording in progress. Good morning. Good morning, Marshall. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, good morning, Honorable Longeni. How, How are, are you? you? I'm fine, I'm fine, no problem. All right, I'm fine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Good, good morning. Uh, I see we left with four minutes. Hey, good morning, Chair. Good morning. Good morning, Honorable Chabaling. Uh, yes, Marcel, how has our numbers looked? Good morning again, Chairperson um, and members, colleagues. Chairperson, we are still waiting on a few members to join. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. When they when they are there, you can just inform. When <laughs> 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 I raise my hand, so I get up here, so I see a shape. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm body then. We didn't meet him now, where we're sitting straight to and then tomorrow. Nine, nine thirty until late. We didn't do same year. No good at all. I'm a budget, but that that reduces in those who come to the NCC. So we probably I think it's seven hours sitting. So from nine thirty nine ten to eleven twelve one two three four. Yeah, I think we we can have a five person. Many of you will let them. I've got a phone. I must get something called an iCloud number so that it will all the numbers I have. I know you are the mini Usai. No, I got it from him, but I think they have other issues. If you put it for dinner, what's the problem? I am a phone, if you number, 
But we say they if for me, not to be seen hard, it's a problem. But now we say baby is better. Mm -hmm. Daddy, 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 can you mute? Oh, what's your mean? Eh? Oh. Yeah, but I'm sure when. Can you mute? Uh, thank you very much, uh, members. Good morning. Um, morning me, good morning, Honorable Weep. Um, let, me, let me take this opportunity to to formally declare this meeting open and then uh, just to go through um, uh, our agenda, if our agenda can be so that we all be familiarize us with the agenda of today. Michelle, can we have the agenda? Okay, in the absence of the agenda at now, um, let me, uh, we will have our opening and welcoming. And then we will have um, the agenda, the adoption of the agenda. And then um, we will have our apologies. Um, um, stakeholders, um, and also, I believe that the minister and the deputy minister will also be here today. And that I will formally uh, uh, welcome the minister and the deputy minister in this uh, very important meeting where we'll be discussing the National uh, Health Insurance Bill, which is a 76 bill. Um, but let's first uh, go to who is supposed to be here. And of, of the committee, the chair of the provinces, um, the Department of Health, uh, the ministers. Um, can we have any apologies, uh, Michelle? Again, good morning, Chairperson, members, colleagues, um, department. Um, we currently have no apologies, Chairperson. We do have a note from Ms. Latuli, who will be joining the meeting a little bit late. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Michelle. Uh, we are now at our third point, which is the briefing uh, by the Department of Health on the National Health Insurance Bill, which is um, a Section 76 bill. And then after that, we will have deliberation, deliberations and then um, the adoption of the committee minutes, which will be a committee matters. Uh, but now we will straight go to point three of the agenda, which is the briefing from the department. And let me also formally again uh, welcome the department to give us a briefing on the, on the national insurance bill. Excuse me, Chairperson, if we can also kindly adopt the agenda. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Michelle. Very much. Thank you very much. Can we have a proposal for the adoption of the agenda? I move for adoption of the agenda, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable uh, Chabaleng. Uh, any um, second? Yes, second. Thank you, Honorable Nkosi. The agenda is being adopted. Then let's go now to the Business of the day, which is the briefing from the department. The department is welcome. Uh, we have got 40 minutes uh, just to, to time in terms of time constraints. I, I see the minister is here. Thank you very much, uh, minister. And you are most welcome uh, today with us. Um, thank you very much. And then thank you very uh, we, much. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes, and then uh, without uh, any delay, um, colleagues, 
Let's then go to the department to brief us. Or if the minister, let me start with the minister. The minister to give us a, an, an overview. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, let me uh, firstly just uh, pass the apology for the Deputy Minister, uh, Deputy Minister Domo. Uh, this is a very uh, busy week uh, for us. Uh, so um, we also have a, a, an engagement out of the country where I was uh, requested to attend a, a, a very important international uh, meeting on, uh, uh, of a, an organization called the Partnership on Maternal Child and Newborn Health. Uh, so I requested uh, the uh, Honorable Deputy Minister uh, to to represent us, so he is currently, uh, as we speak, in that meeting uh, in New Delhi in India. Um, now this happened also at the time when we are also having uh, our national AIDS conference. Um, so uh, I'm I'm currently here in Etequini. Uh, I've just finished opening the uh, TB in Daba. And I've just moved uh, to uh, uh, another room. Uh, so uh, it's a very busy week. Uh, later in the afternoon, we're starting our National AIDS Conference, an annual AIDS Conference also here in Etequini. But thank you very much for this opportunity. So unfortunately for that, uh, Dr. Lomo will not be able to join us. Uh, Honorable Chair, um, Indeed, it is my honor and, and privilege uh, today to, to come and speak uh, to the, uh, the, the select committee of, of the National Council of Provinces. And my greetings to yourself and congratulations on your uh, appointment as the chair uh, of this select committee. Uh, and uh, greetings to, to yourself and all the best. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are very pleased to be here and we, we, are, we appreciate the speed with which you have moved. Because uh, just last Tuesday, seven days ago, um, we debated the National Health Insurance Bill in the National Assembly and National Assembly passed it and then and, and forwarded it now to the National Council of Provinces. And we are very pleased that so speedily you have called us to come and brief uh, the, the, your committee. Um, now, as you would have seen over the last uh, seven days, the passing of the National Health Insurance Bill by the National Assembly has been met with mixed reactions from various stakeholders and commentators. Uh, this bill provides an enabling framework for massive reforms to the entire health landscape in our country. So it is no surprise that it has generated uh, this massive, massive and, and varied reactions, and especially from those with vested interest. The point of departure for the reforms is that access to healthcare is a human right as provided for in section 27 of the constitution of the Republic. Attainment of this, uh, this obvious human right should not be a matter of negotiation. And uh, we appeal to yourselves um, uh, in, in this committee also to take that uh, uh, approach and, and, and that all South Africans, uh, it's important that all South Africans engage with the content of, of this bill as it, and, and its intended impact on the well being of South Africans. South Africa will remain one of the most unequal societies in the world unless uh, citizens stand up and demand an acceleration of the transformation agenda to address the current imbalances in society, including in the way we provide our health services. This bill describes the framework for reconfiguration of the way healthcare services are accessed by both public sector uh, and also private sector providers of, uh, of, of healthcare service. It also describes significant changes to the way that these services will be paid for in the future. Th these reforms aim to achieve a 
a system that ensures that every person receives the health care that they need when they need that care, where they can access it, uh, the care, uh, uh, access the care and service without incurring financial hardships as a result of uh, receiving health services. There is much misinformation about the NHI, which is being peddled out there by those who have a vested interest, as I've mentioned, to protect their interests and who fail to see a future for the, the rest of the people of the country. We ask that uh, the committee focus on the very vulnerable you know, individuals uh, who are the majority of people in our society uh, who need this care and rather than look at the narrow interests of those who uh, fear losing some of, you know, not, not even all, but some of the super profits and, 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 and uh, privileges which they're currently enjoying. So we are, we are pleased that even though uh, the road of passing the bill in the National Assembly, which was submitted in 2019 has taken quite some time, but that finally this has happened. And we are hoping that uh, uh, within the National Council of Provinces as well, um, we know it's, it's not going to be an uh, easy going, but we, we hope in that uh, the committee will manage this uh, at various provinces such that uh, we can be able to get the positive you know, uh, result at the end of, of the exercise. Um, Honorable Chair, I do have with me uh, members of um, the department, including uh, the, the Director General of the department. I've already indicated that the Deputy Minister will not be able to join us because of the, to save time, uh, Honorable Chair, um, I'm going to invite uh, Professor Nicholas Crisp, who's going to uh, make a presentation with your permission, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, and, but we've got a, a full team from the National Department who will also participate when questions come. But Professor Crisp is the one who's going to, uh, with your permission, uh, if he can be allowed uh, to go ahead and make the presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much, um, Honorable Minister uh, Pata, for a very detailed, brief um, overview. Um, we will immediately then move to the department. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Uh, good morning. And thank you, Honorable Minister. Thank you, Honorable Chair, and uh, all the members of the um, Select Committee, to the other colleagues from the Department of Health, DG, and others, and to the members of the media and the public. I'm going to move quite quickly through the presentation because um, there's quite a lot to get through, and the objective of the presentation is to um, make sure that the Select Committee is comfortable with the contents of the bill. So we'll start with the purpose of the bill. And uh, so the bill is, establishes a fund as a legally defined organ of state. It will be a section 3A public entity in terms of the Public Finance Management Act. And it seeks to establish the fund with its functions, powers, and duties. And it provides for the control of this fund by a board. So there are sections that deal with the composition of the board, the appointment of the board, chairperson and vice chairperson, how the meetings will be held, the appointment of various committees of the board, and who may or may not be allowed to be on the board. The bill also seeks to define the beneficiaries of the service who will be covered by the fund, including how those members will register on the system, and provides for contracting of providers who must be accredited to deliver the health services for the fund, and the minister will determine those criteria and regulations, as is the case in all uh, legislation. It also provides for the minister to determine which benefits will be reimbursed by the fund, as well as the service coverage and the cost, uh, the cost measures uh, in, in regulations. So the bill is laid out in a number of chapters. I'm sorry, it says parts here. That was a, an oversight. There are chapters. There are 11 chapters. And I'm going to briefly take us through each one of those chapters of the highlights of the content of the chapters in the bill. So I've already dealt with the purpose and application, but very at a high level, what it does is it establishes this fund. And then uh, the fund will be funded through mandatory prepayments and through taxes. 
which we will talk about a bit later under one of the other chapters. This fund will be the single purchaser in a single payer of the services. That is a model which we'll describe and I'm sure we'll answer questions. And it is a mechanism for pooling of the funds uh, from, that are both from current public and private sources to allow the fund to do what we call strategic purchasing of health services and to purchase, uh, to procure goods from accredited and contracted health service providers. This act applies to all health establishments, public and private, but excluding the military health services and the state security agency. And it does not affect the funding and functioning of any other organs of state in respect of the healthcare services until any relevant legislation is enacted or amended. So until those clauses are brought into effect, the status quo remains. And in the application of the act, uh, the, the bill says that where there is any conflict with any other legislation, then this act will prevail, except in the case of the Constitution and the PFMA. And that's then relevant to the National Health Act. So regarding the access to health services, the intention in population coverage is that the fund will purchase services on behalf of all South African citizens, also permanent residents, refugees, inmates and specific categories of foreign nationals. And it has a clause that deals with limited access for asylum seekers and illegal foreigners, where uh, it's not a fully comprehensive uh, access uh, that is, uh, is uh, provided for them. However, for all children, irrespective of who they are, the fund will cover all their health care. And then there's a provision for visiting foreign nationals, such as people who come on holiday or business, where there's a requirement for them to come with travel insurance. Now, users, that's everybody who is covered in the population coverage, holiday or will be business, eligible a requirement and for must register, including insurance. children, with an now, accredited users, healthcare provider who is or an establishment, in the which coverage, is like a hospital or a clinic or a primary health care facility or register, general including children. Newborns will be automatically registered when their birth is registered, and there must be a supervising adult who is held responsible for the registration. Um, so the way to identify and ensure that we are not providing health care to the wrong person is through biometrics, and that will be prescribed in regulations, but it's likely to be fingerprint identification. Furthermore, in access, the users, uh, those are all of us who are users of the healthcare system, will have rights. We will have rights to a quality of healthcare services free at the point of care. Uh, our information relating to the fund, services provided by the fund, in other words, the benefits, and our own personal information will be accessible to us. We will not be refused access on any unreasonable grounds access to care within a reasonable time frame, reasonable decisions about our own health care, and we will be able to submit complaints and be given written reasons for any fund's decisions related to our health care. So users will have our health care purchased at health care services, and if we do not have, uh, if those services are not provided, we will have the right to uh, purchase them from complementary voluntary medical schemes for those services not provided by the fund. As far as the healthcare service coverage is concerned, the fund is held accountable for purchasing these services on behalf of all the beneficiaries. And where provider or establishment is unable to provide those services to us, the act requires or the bill requires that that facility or provider must transfer us as users to another provider or establishment. The re there's a requirement of the bill that we enter the healthcare system at the primary healthcare level. We call that gatekeeping. And then the primary healthcare providers will uh, refer us following referral pathways, depending on the condition and what other care we need. There's a, a provision that the minister must designate the central hospitals. So at the moment, there are 10 central hospitals as semi-autonomous national government components that are accessible to everybody in the country. And treatment will be, not be funded by the fund if it has not been shown to be medically necessary or if it is not cost-effective and not included in the formulary. 
But as I've said, there was a provision previously that for those other services, we are entitled to insure ourselves voluntarily for complementary benefits. If the fund declines a benefit, that the fund will have to provide reasons and allow the user uh, to appeal the process. And what's most important is that we are designing the system to be free at the point of care. As the Honorable Minister said, we do not want people to be uh, devastated by their health care. The next chapter deals with the National Health Insurance Fund itself. As I mentioned, it will be a Schedule 3A public entity in terms of the Public Finance Management Act. And the functions of the fund are to purchase the services and enter into procurement contracts for goods and products. There must be timely reimbursement of the providers, determine the payment rates annually, and there will be a prescribed manner in the regulations. The appropriate funding of healthcare services at various levels must be monitored and seen to by the fund, as well as the monitoring of the quality and the standard of healthcare is provided by the accredited providers. So the fund must maintain a performance profile of all the service providers and will pay for that performance rather than just flat rates. The fund must monitor the impact of the fund. We are trying to address the healthcare needs of everyone and achieve equity and will liaise and exchange information between the department and any other entities and statutory councils that are needed to do the work of the fund. The fund must maintain a national database of the population using the health services, in other words, the demographics, but also what we call epidemiological or the disease burden and profile of the users of the service, and must perform all these functions in the most cost-effective and efficient manner possible, and align what they are doing with the health policies approved by the minister, which is done in terms of the public of the National Health Act through the National Health Council. And it's the responsibility of the fund to contribute to the protection, promotion, improvement, and maintenance of the entire the health of the entire population. So the fund then is given powers in order to enable it to fulfill those functions. Like with, as with all. Uh, Schedule 3A entities, the fund will employ the necessary personnel and purchase its whatever goods and equipment, land and buildings and related assets necessary to run the fund itself. It will be allowed to manage its own bank accounts, so to draw, draft, accept, endorse, discount and sign whatever banking uh, negotiations are needed to be able to run the activities, the administration of the fund itself. It will be empowered to insure against any loss, damage, risk, or liability, and it must have powers to investigate any complaints against the fund, the providers, the establishment, or the suppliers, and implement the best practices in terms of purchasing of services, procurements of goods, e efficient delivery of health services, and also the data and analysis, collation, data collection and analysis of that data, and will be responsible for fraud prevention. The fund will also research any, anything that is required to improve universal health coverage and may exchange information with other organs of state. Uh, that includes other public entities. And it will be able to defend itself in legal proceedings because it will be a legal persona and must negotiate, will have the powers to negotiate the lowest possible prices for the services and goods that it is empowered to administer. When we move to the fourth chapter, it deals with the board. Now, because this is a public entity, it must have a board, and the board will be uh, governed by the Public Finance Management Act as the accounting authority of that entity. And the board will, the minister that it's accountable to is the Minister of Health. The board will be constituted by 11 members, uh, members appointed by the minister with cabinet approval and must have expertise in a wide range, including healthcare financing, health economics, public health planning, monitoring and evaluation, law, actuarial sciences, information technology and communication, and board members' terms will be five years, renewable once, and there are a range of exclusions which are linked to conflicts of interest. Now, in order to get the nominations for the board and to make recommendations to the cabinet, the minister must appoint an ad hoc panel, and that panel will interview the candidates and make recommendations of a list to the minister to process through the, the cabinet and finally to appointment. 
There's also provisions for the minister to remove board members, and there are specified conditions. It can't be arbitrary. There must be due course and uh, due reason and due process. And the minister may also dissolve the board, the board, but only after an inquiry and cabinet approval, in which case the minister will also be empowered by the cabinet to appoint an acting board for a period of up to three months. The chairperson will be, uh, and the deputy chairpersons, the minister will appoint the chair after consulting the cabinet, and the board will select the deputy chair of the, amongst their members. So the chapter four also lays out the functions and powers of the board, uh, and that's besides the, the fund as an entity, and the, the, the board is empowered to fulfill the functions of the accounting authority required by the PFMA, must meet at least four times a year, and it will advise the minister on matters relating to the fund, including financing, administration, pricing, and a range of other matters that are listed in the bill. The board will defi define the types of reports that are required from its executive management in order for it to fulfill that uh, oversight role and to report not only to the minister, but as all 3A entities must report to, uh, the, uh, to parliament. Um, the board is required to conduct its business in a way where it discloses all members must disclose their interests and any paid employment that will conflict with the work of the fund must be declared, even if it is only a potential conflict of interest. And so the, the, the bill requires these declarations of interests. As far as the procedures of how the board will function and how it will work with its board committees, which I'll talk about in a moment, the board will determine its own procedures and those will be documented and uh, available in the public domain. The remuneration and re reimbursement of board members is determined uh, by the, the Minister of Finance and is al as always is a, a discussion between the Minister of Health and Minister of Finance, but these rates are uh, determined uh, depending on the size and complexity of boards by the Minister of Finance. Chapter 5 deals with the ex Chief Executive Officer. So it requires that the, appoint, the, the fund, the board, must appoint a, technical, a person who has technical competence and experience in the necessary fields of the functions of the, of the fund, of the, of the entity. The board will interview the candidates and choose, select the candidate and recommend, as in the case of all 3A entities, for the responsible minister, the Minister of Health, to make the appointment, to sign the appointment. The term will be five years, renewable once, and the board may recommend the removal of the CEO under circumstances that are uh, outlined in the bill. The responsibilities of the chief executive officer will be that the CEO accounts to the board and the functions are, of the CEO are assigned by the board and the CEO will be responsible for running an efficient administration, including the human resources, the necessary uh, investigation units, complaints, corruption, and whatever other staff are required, the CEO will be responsible for the appointment of those staff. The CEO is responsible for liaising with district health management uh, organizations, which are outlined uh, later in the bill, and will establish an, a range of units which are uh, prescribed in the bill for planning, for definition of benefits, for provider rates and payments determinations, the accreditation of providers, purchasing arrangements and contracting of services and, and uh, health products, the payment for admin of administration and the performance monitoring and risk and fraud. As with all public entities, the CEO will be responsible for the annual report. And there's also a clause that deals with required meetings between the, the chief executive officer with the Ministry of Health, specifically with the DG, but also with the Office of Health Standards Compliance and, uh, and other agencies. The chapter six deals with committees to be established by the board. Now these committees are uh, common to most public entities and most companies, since public entities also comply with the Companies Act. Uh, these are committees such as the Remuneration Committee, Finance Committee, Audit and Risk Committee, and the board will determine how its 
governance committees will be appointed and how they will report to the board and when they will function and they must meet at least four times a year. The board may also appoint technical committees, which may relate to its own functions, and it may appoint them temporarily or permanently, and the persons participating in those technical committees must have the relevant expertise and the proper fit, as with all other committees, must, and the board itself must uh, deal with its conflict of interest and must not be able to abuse their positions on the board. So quite an, an issue about conflict of interest. There are also a number of uh, three advisory committees, which are statutory committees provided for in Chapter 7. The first one is the Benefits Advisory Committee. So although the administration of the fund will deal with the details of the benefits, this is an oversight committee with expertise in medicine, public health, health economics, epidemiology, and the rights of patients, where the minister will appoint the chair and they, they will have also a five-year term, renewable ones, and, they, and the minister will determine the service benefits, uh, uh, sorry, the fund will de determine the service benefits by level of care, uh, obviously the groundwork being done in the administration of the fund, that they will be responsible for ensuring the cost-effective treatment guidelines and that regulations to, uh, will detail the, their terms of reference so that this is in the public domain. The second committee is once the benefits that the fund can cover are determined, the Healthcare Benefits Pricing Committee is responsible for recommending prices for these health service benefits. And the minister will appoint the chair of this committee as well. The fund provides for 16 persons maximum with expertise in a wide range, including actuarial science, medicine, epidemiology, health management, health economics, health financing, but also labor and rights of patients. And there will be a member representing the ministry uh, in that pricing committee. The third statutory committee will be a stakeholder advisory committee, which, where the, which is created to allow for representatives from professional councils, health entities, labor, civil society organizations, professional associations, and advocacy groups to come together, uh, this will be detailed under regulations of how often this will happen, to discuss issues pertinent to the functioning and advice of how the, the fund should serve the public and the, in the country. In all committees, the bill uh, has sections that deal with disclosures of interests and procedures and remuneration. Again, all committees in these entities the remuneration is determined by the Minister of Finance on the motivation of the Minister of Health. Chapter 8 deals with some general provisions applicable to the operation of the fund, in particular trying to separate the role of the minister, the role of the department and others. So the minister is held accountable in the Constitution and in the Health Act for the health of everybody in the country whether it's in the public or private sector, no matter who's paying for it. So the governance and stewardship of the whole health system, including the National Health Insurance Fund, is uh, assigned to the minister in the act. And the minister must ensure that the roles and responsibilities of the fund, the national and the provincial departments are delineated, considering the constitutional requirements and also the National Health Act to ensure and that the that duplication doesn't in, uh, occur and to make sure there's equitable provision and financing for everybody in the country. So it's the overall ultimate stewardship role. The National Department uh, is responsible in terms of the National Health Act and the Constitution for policies, guidelines, and standards, which other entities are responsible for administering. So the department ultimately sets the guidelines for norms and standards, human resources planning, development, production and management, the overall coordination of all the health services in the country, planning the development of the public and private health establishments and their role in the delivery of health care, integrating all annual health plans in the public sector and is subject to section um, by, through being subject to 57, the minister may introduce amendments 
which ensure that these various roles are possible and may delegate the functions uh, in terms of this act to provinces, designate categories of hospitals as autonomous legal entities, and establish new structures such as the district health management offices as government components. So the role of the provinces is also dealt with in this chapter, specifically in section 32, and there's a realignment where the Minister of Health will delegate to provinces as the management agencies for the purpose of the provision of healthcare services. And in the, these cases, the fund will then contract with the provinces, the provincial health departments, including the provincial tertiary, regional and emergency services, how the services will be delivered by public sector providers and paid for by the fund. There will also be responsibility on the provinces to manage ambulance services. This is uniquely prescribed in the constitution, so it is already dealt with there. And it will, uh, the provinces must assist the district health management officers in controlling the quality of the health services and facilities, not only of the public sector, but of the private sector who are accredited to provide services. Provinces also responsible for delegating provincial and regional hospitals and, and providing specialized hospital services. They will be responsible for participating in interprovincial and intersectoral coordination. There's a lot of that happens with what we call the social determinants of health with many other government departments and ensuring that collaboration. And provinces are also responsible for providing technical and logistical support to the district health councils and coordinating health and medical services during provincial disasters. The further roles of the provinces are provision and coordination of emergency services, forensic pathology, forensic clinical medicine and related services, including the provision of the medical legal mortuaries and the medical legal services, and providing and maintaining equipment and vehicles to enable them to do their job, consulting with communities, promoting health and life uh, health and healthy lifestyles, providing environmental pollution control services, and for health systems research and programs, both in the public sector and also private sector and the health services as a whole. Chapter 8 deals with the operations of the fund, uh, including the role of medical schemes, where the National Health uh, Insurance Bill says that once the national health insurance is fully implemented, the minister may introduce regulations that limit the benefits to services that are not reimbursable by the fund. So this is what we have referred to as complementary health care or top-up services. Once the fund is able to cover the benefits systematically over time, the medical schemes will no longer cover those same services. It also deals with the district health management office where the national, which will be national government components responsible for managing the services within each of the 52 districts, facilitating, supporting, and coordinating the primary healthcare services uh, and also the non personal healthcare services. The bill uh, introduces contracting units for primary healthcare. This was amended in the portfolio committee as being an organizational unit of the funds that will manage the contracts as primary health care level. And it uh, will include the, the district hospitals, clinics, the community health centers, the ward-based outreach teams, and all the private providers in the primary health care space within a designated geographical area where these uh, contracting units will assist with understanding the burden of disease and accrediting the providers in those environments, managing their contracts and ensuring that they have referral systems in function. This, un this uh, section, uh, chapter also deals with health products procurement. This was also slightly amended the portfolio committee, but the intention is to centralize the facilitation and coordination of the first stage of procurement of healthcare goods where the unit must determine the selection and the procurement process, as well as prices and management of contracts for the entire health system, uh, which may be purchased by accredited providers. 
And so it will work to support the Benefits Advisory Committee to develop and maintain the formulary of the essential medicines list and the essential equipments list, uh, as well as whatever else uh, is part of the Benefits Advisory Committee's um, delegation. They will review this formulary, taking into account the burden of disease, new medicines and technologies, and evidence of new treatment options and price changes. The accreditation of service providers is dealt with in this chapter as well. The starting point is that the Office of Health Standards Compliance will certify providers for the standards that are set in terms of the policies of the National Department of Health. And the accredited providers must provide a range of services that they are capable to provide. And they must have the appropriate number and mix of health professionals. They must adhere to the treatment protocols and referral pathways and submit information that is necessary for the proper planning of services and monitoring of the equity of the distribution of services. They must adhere to the national pricing regimen and in so doing, they will conclude a legally binding contract uh, with the fund. So between the establishment or provider and the fund for up to five years, uh, which is renewable, of course. And the conditions for renew renewal will relate to any changes or adaptations in the benefits package, certification, staffing, referral, referral pathways, et cetera. Providers may be refused accreditation under certain circumstances if they uh, deviate from the agreed contracts, but there will be an appeal process which is provided for in the bill. This chapter also deals with the information platform for the fund. Clearly, to manage all of this, there needs to be an information platform. So the fund provides that the providers of healthcare and the establishment must submit certain information, which will be prescribed in regulations and may change from time to time. And the fund must use that information to plan, budget, monitor, and adhere to guidelines and to make sure that personal information of users is maintained as confidential information and not accessible in the public domain. The payments of these providers will be different in different parts of the system. The bill provides that primary care providers will be contracted and remunerated on a capitation model via the contracting units for primary health care, but that specialists and hospitals would be paid on a performance-based system. We call uh, the system uh, diagnostic-related groups, which is more uh, uh, grouped or, or outcomes-based uh, payments. And there's a specific provision for capped fee-based systems for the emergency medical services. The minister may make regulations relating to these payment mechanisms, obviously on the advice of the statutory committees I've already outlined. So I won't spend much time on complaints and appeals except to say that the bill does uh, provide for the management of complaints and the lodging of appeals by either uh, providers or users of the service. The, the appeal tribun tri tribunal will be a five-person tribunal appointed by the minister and it has powers similar to the high court. The secretariat of these various uh, appeals and tri uh, appeals tribunals will be provided by the fund and the procedure and remuneration for tribunal members will be done in consultation as they are now in other functions with the Minister of Finance. And again, we will need to, uh, they will have to comply with the conflict of interest clause. And if necessary, a complainant who is still unhappy may seek redress through the courts. Getting to the finance method, matters and Honorable Chair, I'm getting towards the end of the bill. This uh, chapter deals with the sources of funding, which includes appropriations, interest, and bequests. But we all know the chief source of funding will be appropriations from the, uh, the, the Treasury through the parliamentary process of allocations of budgets. And the money will be raised through general tax revenues. And that will happen over time through, according to the provisions of the bill, through shifting of provincial equitable share and conditional grants, uh, the redirection of medical scheme tax credits. There's a provision for the possible introduction of payroll taxes and surcharges on personal income tax. And those will be done through the decisions of the Minister of Finance. 
The auditing of the fund, as with all Schedule 3A entities, is through the Auditor General of South Africa. And annual reports are also dealt with in terms of the Public Finance Management Act, where all Schedule 3A entities submit to Parliament and the Minister, and there's a fully audited finance. Activities are undertaken, pro progress monitored, and any additional reporting information is provided in the annual reports to Parliament on Parliament's request. There are some miscellaneous pro uh, provisions in uh, Chapter 11, which deals with assignments of duties and delegations of powers to enable the um, various officials within the uh, employ of the fund to, to uh, execute their functions. There's also a section that deals with the protection of confidential information and requires the fund to comply with all the legislation that is in this domain. There's a provision for some offenses and penalties and quite a long section on regulations which may be promulgated to give effect to all of these various uh, the clauses in the chapters that I've outlined. There's also a provision for the fund to issue directives, such as we see from the Medical Schemes Council, Council for Medical Schemes, in terms of the Medical Schemes Act. The fund deals with transitional provisions, uh, and it has been modified because of the timelines lost during COVID when the portfolio committee was not able to meet and other delays. So I'm not going to go through the details of them. But the intention is the period we are entering now from the time that this bill is enacted for the next three or four years is to ensure that we get the fund's administration up and running and the contents of what is intended from the fund into the public domain and to begin to roll out in some of these areas using the funds that are already in the public domain, the new purchasing mechanisms. Phase two will then be to strengthen and roll out further uh, the provisions of the Act. Lastly, Honorable Chair, there are a number of legislative amendments in Schedule 1. The most important ones for this committee to be aware of and to pay attention to is the National Health Act, uh, which is an Act of 2003. There are a number of important amendments in that Act in Schedule 1 particularly some introductions of district health management officers and the functions of the national and the provincial departments of health are modified in section 25 of the National Health Act. There are other minor uh, changes in all the, the other acts listed uh, here on this slide. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. I'm going to end there. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Prof. Thank you very much. Um, let me first check before we move on. Are there any uh, any further uh, deliberations on the presentation? Anyone else from the department is going to make any input? Yeah. Uh, honorable uh, chair if not yeah. then yeah, yes, honorable minister yeah i think we are done from our side uh, we are ready to take any uh, questions from your committee uh, from our side there will be no further additions thank you very much thank, thank you all right thank you very much honorable minister uh, thank you very much uh, for the team from the department um uh, we have another 20 minutes for 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 questions i can see the hands um honorable Lutuli, honorable christians um any further hands for the first round honorable uh, dongeni um okay honorable Lutuli, christians dongeni Okay. Any further hands? Okay, we have the three hands now. Um, um, my, 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 my hand is up, Chair. Okay, thank you. And the pro, and the pro the pro okay, and Yes. 
My hand is also up. Let me quickly. Uh, okay, Honorable Tuli, Honorable Christians, Honorable Dongheni, um, Honorable uh, Chabaling, Honorable Nkosi, and Honorable Mbulelo, ne? Mbulelo. Chair, my hand is up. Okay, see, can you or honorable the Healy? Honorable Healy. Okay, um, those are hands from the committee. Um, Chair. Okay, Chair, can, can, you, can you, Chair? Yes, uh, Minister. The person, can you ask the person, people who are not muted to mute their mics because. They say they, they, they sound in the background from, I okay. don't know, from mm -hmm. what, yeah. All right. Okay, honorable, thank you very much, honorable Chablin. Okay, pro provinces can also participate. Can we start, can we start with uh, the following hands? Honorable Lutuli. Thank you, Chaperson, and greeting to everyone. And my apologies for my video. Um, Chairperson, uh, um, one would like to appreciate the department for coming and presenting this bill to us. I have a few questions to ask. Uh, the first question is, what does the passing of this uh, NHI bill mean to the South African health providers and users? And the uh, second question, Chairperson, we understand that most of, of the people don't have IDs. As we do uh, our, our door to doors, we find out that most of people don't have IDs. So, does this department have a plan how to assist those people? And also, uh, Chairperson, can the department please clarify on how the NHI registration process would work? There, there have been um, concerns regarding the state of infrastructure in the public hospital. Then the question is, how will the registration database fu function at the current infrastructure challenges at the state hospital. Last question, Chairperson, um, are they, um, or last question, Chairperson, will the individuals be able to use any health facilities of their choice or they will be only at those hospitals as a way to see where for them to, 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 to go to? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Honorable Tuli. Honorable Christians. Thank you, Chairperson. I'm going to put my camera off. Uh, Chairperson, I have quite a few questions, but I want to start off by saying that there are obviously a host of concerns with regard to the National Health Insurance Bill. And ones that we cannot overlook, ones that need to be properly interrogated before this bill is passed, not only does the committee have oh, have a concern with the um, with the bill, but there are also a host of people in the public sector that have issues with an NHI bill. So my first question, Chairperson, is the implementation challenges. Now, how does the health department plan to address the current issues? of the poor service, service delivery, because across the country, there are issues with uh, service delivery. There's lack of staff, there's inadequate infrastructure. All of this will hinder the implementation of NHI. How will the department overcome that? Additionally, what measures will be taken to ensure that strict requirements for obtaining healthcare do not exclude the poorest of the poor? And that is really the main concern. And how does the health department plan to address the potential threats of tender corruption, fraud, and looting of the NHI fund? So that is with regard to implementation challenges. Secondly, certificates of need, which is briefly mentioned in the bill. And obviously, the department needs to provide more clarity on that, can the health department provide clarity on the constitutional scrutiny, uh, scrutiny of the certificates of need? In other words, how will this affect the bill's provision? If certificates of need are deemed 
constitutional. How will the health department address the material aspects of the bill that rely on these certificates? That in connection with the certificates of need. Then the ministerial powers. What steps will be taken to prevent an overreach of powers by the Minister of Health to ensure the autonomy of the NHI fund? Because we've heard that the Minister of Health will oversee um, not only the board, but how the board is um, constituted. Um, also, the appointment of board members. Additionally, how will the health department ensure transparency and then prevent kind of deployment to the appointment of board members and the chairperson of the NHI fund? A huge concern. Financial feasibility is another huge issue. Has the health department conducted a feasibility study? If they have, they have not indicated it anywhere to us in any presentation, not to the portfolio committee and neither to um, the select committee in any of the briefings. So has the health department conducted a feasibility study to determine the exact costing model and the ability of both parliament and treasury to provide sustainable funding for NHI without compromising healthcare quality? And then of huge concern, as I said, there's huge concerns of the ordinary man on the street there. How will the department address the concerns of taxpayers regarding additional taxes and the potential impact on the working population? Please, can they expand on that and not give us just a um, brief undertaking on that? Please, can they explain to the public, because this is especially to taxpayers out there, explain to us with regard to additional taxes and the potential impact on the working population. Infrastructure and service delivery, what plans are in place to address the current infrastructure? I've already said there's a lack of budget, there's understaffing. The provinces are all um, on the platform today. I can assure both the minister, the deputy minister, the presenter, that all of them will agree that there is a lack of budget, there's understaffing. Most hospitals don't have adequate medical supplies. How will they deal with that, with the implementation of the NHI? How will they provide adequate health care if the basic infrastructure is not improved in provinces? Then, with regard to the accredited health care providers that Professor Crisp was speaking about, how will the health uh, department address the lack of resources for inspecting and accrediting healthcare service providers? What measures will be taken to prevent a catastrophic situation where public hospitals are unable to provide services due to non-accreditation? So non-accreditation, huge issue. Please provide us some clarity on that. Because the provinces are online as well, provincial powers and duties, how will the department ensure that the centralization of powers from provincial authorities complies with the constitutional framework and respects the existing health legislation? Then I also have a question with regard to medical aid providers. We also need clarity, or can the department clarify how the removal of the option to choose medical aid scheme aligns with the individual's rights to choose freedom of association and access to medical care as protected by the constitution. Please can the department provide in detail for us how that aligns with the constitution. How will the health department ensure that individuals who rely on medical aid schemes do not experience delays or decreased quality of health care under the, in, under the um, NHI? And then uh, two of my last questions <clears throat> with regard to the National Health Information System. Obviously, with regard to the, Pop, uh, the POPIA Act, what measures will be implemented to address concerns of data breaches and breaches of the POPIA Act? when establishing and maintaining single databases um, for the NHI and how will the department ensure that all healthcare facilities, including those with limited access to technology, can effectively capture and utilize data within the proposed um, information system. And then lastly, the single fund pur um, purchaser. How will the health department establish guidelines and criteria for the purchasing of medical aid services by the NHI I fund to ensure transparency and fairness to all. I have a few other qu questions, um, a chairperson. Perhaps I can just also, something that's of huge concern is the complaints procedure. 
just very lastly, what steps will be taken to establish an independent and impartial complaints procedure that is not under the direct influence of the Minister of Health? Um, because I think that is also one of the main concerns of, of, of everyone. Can the health department provide cl clarification on the time frames so when dealing with such complaints, especially in cases where medical procedures are pending or urgent, as that is a huge issue in most of the provinces where people lay for months and months waiting for procedures to be done and um, there's just not the necessary assistance for these people. So those are my questions, Chairperson, and thank you very much. Okay, thank you. The next, the next questions will come from Honorable Dongeni. Thank you, Chair. Morning, everybody in the meeting. Hey, the first speaker, the second speaker, hey, ask everything, you know? Okay, Chair. My question, thank you for about the, <clears throat> the information you gave us. You, you have been detailed about the information, but we have some few questions. My question is, what is the department doing in terms of boarding in workforce, especially the district managers on the implementation of the NHI? The second one, Chair, what are the plans by the department to ensure that there is enough, enough workforce for the implementation of the NHI? And is there a retention strategy by the department? What are the lessons from the NHIS. Even developed countries with functional national health scheme experience challenges as seen during the COVID-19 pandemic, how is the issue of inadequate and overbent human resource for health being addressed? Thank you, Chairperson. That's my questions. Sorry, sorry, Chair. Honorable Sorry, Minister. Yes, Honorable uh, the first part of uh, Honorable Ndongeni's question, if she can just repeat uh, on my side, I didn't really get clarity on the first question. Thank okay. Honorable Ndongeni. Okay, Chair. Okay, Minister. My question is, what is the department doing in terms of onboarding its workforce? especially the district managers on the implementation okay. of the NHI. Okay, okay, that's fine. Thank you, thank you. Thank right. you, Honorable Dongeni, Honorable Chabaleng. Um, thanks, Chairperson. Um, thank you. Uh, I think a lot of questions were asked for me. Um, those questions covered the, and the things that I wanted to, to ask. And, and that it is good that members are asking these questions in the meeting so that when we go out in the provinces to make these presentations, we go in there with a, a complete information, you know, uh, knowing what the, uh, our concerns are about the bill and also the way forward in terms of what needs to be done. Um, I just want to check for myself, the person, that uh, the, we know that there are problems related to infrastructure of health. And, and that is not only a phenomenon in South Africa, it's, it's, it's happening all over the world. Uh, even in the developed uh, countries, uh, COVID has actually shown that there are gaps and, and all communities and societies that care about their citizens are doing something to close those gaps. I just wanna find in terms of the NHI bill, uh, how will the NHI bill help us to improve our infrastructure and also to help us increase the number of health uh, professionals, particularly specialists, 
in areas where they are not easily reachable, uh, like in, in deep rural areas. Uh, we all know that having a doctor to stay in a rural area where there are no facilities, young doctors find it difficult to operate in those kind of uh, environments. So all of them will prefer, majority of them, let me say, without um, majority, of, some of them will prefer to work in the cities where there are amenities. Now, how will this help us to attract uh, these young uh, professionals who work in rural, in, in, in deep rural areas? And um, how will also, how will this also uh, help us to enhance the uh, technology in hospitals, like, you know, equipment and, and all other <laughs> necessary tools that are needed uh, for health. And some of these things come at a very, very high price, I'm told. They, they you know, they cost millions and millions of rents. And that, uh, how will this help us to acquire those? And where will we get, where will we get the funding to ensure that, uh, those dreams are achieved or those plans are definitely are finally put in place and that we've got a, a health system that will cater for those who cannot cater for themselves. Uh, the other thing I'd like to know is, is this really going to, will the NHI close all private health facilities? If not, how are they going to coexist and um, yeah, and is there going to be a cap, for instance, in terms of what medical practitioners can charge? Because in many instances, you find people charge steadily absorbent uh, prices for, you know, I mean, uh, fares for, 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 for surgery and other things. Um, is there going to be, you know, like limitations in terms of what people can charge and not charge? Thanks, uh, Chairperson. Um, uh, yeah, thank you. I think thank this. You, is, thank you very uh, much, Honorable uh, Chabaleng. Uh, yeah, the Honorable questions Kossi. are touched, my name. Honorable Kosi, thank you very much, Honorable Chabaleng. Chabaleng. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Let me not waste your time. I'm covered by the speakers that uh, spoke before me. I'll be wasting your 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 time. Thank you. And but let us welcome the detailed presentation made by the the department and the honourable minister. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, honourable Whip. Uh, honourable Mbulelo. Um, thank you, uh, Chairperson, and let me also welcome the presentation by the by the department. Uh, just briefly, Chair, because I think a lot of issues have been have been covered, um, except to uh, concretely get a sense of how does the department envisage implementing the NHI once the bill is passed? Can the department share its practical plan with the committee in terms of um, uh, in terms of uh, funding uh, modalities? Um, secondly, Chairperson, um, having gotten the presentation, where to from here? What is the plan in terms of um, holding public hearings to get a sense of what the people's views are? And um, the third one, Chair, is around the private and public um, um, institutions of health. Um, what are the views of the of the sector um, or the private sector specifically in terms of buy-in and support of um, um, the, the 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 NHI? Um, the fourth one, Chairperson, is is more to to get a sense in terms of will individuals be able to use any health facility of their choice at a minimal cost with a rollout of, um, of, of NHI. So, so that's briefly what I thought I should add on the 
host of questions that have been raised by, by other members. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Honorable Mbulelo, Honorable Healy. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, it's Lihihi. Uh, My apology, Honorable. Insurance. Okay, Honorable Lihihi. With, the, with the National Health Insurance be also offered to the unemployment people and will they be able to afford the monthly payments? Will foreigners and South African citizens that has no legal documents be allowed to be insured by the said insurance? Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Lehi. Um, any further from any, the provinces are also allowed to Yes, Chairperson. Uh, my hand is up, Chair. Okay, Honorable Mtube. No, thank, thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, welcome the presentation by the department and the minister. I think uh, I'm largely covered by the by the members, chairperson. I just wanted to check, like uh, Dr. Bach have said, that uh, what will be uh, what will be the rollout? The, what will the rollout look like uh, of of the NHI, chairperson? And I also want to check the time frames. Uh, when uh, do we envisage that we will begin with the with the NHI? Lastly, Chairperson, I wanted to check in in terms of the funds. Uh, I wanted to check with the department. Will uh, would we already have measures because the bill is a uh, it's it's yet to be processed by the NCOP. Are there any measures maybe in the bill to make sure that nobody will temper Chairperson with the fund? You know. Adam Smith, because we do know that uh, at times uh, the people who are normally tasked with uh, with funds, they normally get tempted to 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 fiddle in terms of the funds. So I just wanted to check, Chairperson, what measures have we deployed to make sure that the funds will will be allocated, will be rather not allocate, will will do as uh, it's supposed to everything that is supposed to be done, Chairperson, that uh, there'll be no corruption or malfeasance of, of funds. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, members. Um, uh, I think let me first quickly take the member confident is that in terms of so that when the response is going to come out from the minister and the uh, department, that we know how, how we're going to move going forward to cover that part. Uh, the, the, the bill is a six week cycle. And then uh, the next step is provincial brief, will be provincial briefings. And then um, public hearings in the province provinces, as well as a call for written submissions by our committee in the coming weeks. And then finally will be the finalization, the bill in October due to parliamentary recess. Uh, just to take members into confidence in terms of how we're going to move forward. And then we'll then give to the minister and to the department to respond. We had uh, eight uh, participants who uh, raised questions and clarities. Then we'll give them now to the minister and the department. Thank you very much, minister. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, honorable chairperson. Uh, and also to all the members for the various questions which have been posed. Um, as I've indicated, I do have a number of people from the department. Uh, the presenter, uh, Professor Nicholas Crisp, uh, the DG uh, will also, uh, I'm sure, take some uh, uh, questions. Um, I think Dr. Tulare is also there, um, and uh, Advocate Moavelo on the legal side may have some some areas to cover. Uh, I will I will just on a on a high level make a few comments, um, and then um, I'll just uh, from there. I think to to uh, for to get the matters to move speedily, uh, I will start with uh, with uh, Dr. Crisp, and then there might be areas which uh, Dr. Tulare 
might also have to come in um, in terms of the role of medical schemes, the role of private uh, hospitals, uh, lessons from the NHS, how do we uh, make sure that we retain uh, staff? So the team, the team will share. But let me, let me, let me start a chair. I'm just, just to enable uh, uh, this uh, the, the connectivity. I'm going to switch on the camera. Um, now, in terms of what, uh, just uh, uh, picking up on some aspects of what Honorable Lutuli uh, about the meaning of NHI to to the users, um, as we have said. Um, there is no dispute about the fact that uh, where we are, um, we, we have a situation where over time we have evolved into a two-tier health system, um, both on, on, the, on the public health side, carrying the care of the large majority of South Africans, about 85% of the population depends on the public health system, uh, which is uh, overburdened in terms of demand for services um, on, on uh, quite a lot of pressure. Uh, on the other side, you have the, the public health, I mean, the private health system, uh, which, you know, in terms of the resources of, uh, of the country, uh, because um, uh, if you look at, uh, I mean, in terms of the financial consumption, uh, uh, while the uh, public sector looks after 85% of the population uh, in terms of expenditure of the full financial expenditure uh, uh, of South Africans uh, uh, from, I would say both from the public and also from private resources, because um, if you look at what is spent in the private uh, health, uh, a lot of it in terms of uh, uh, individuals' contribution to their medical schemes, but also uh, contribution by employers, including in that respect, a huge contribution by the state, not only in terms of tax rebates, but also a big chunk of the medical schemes also uh, depend quite a lot on public, uh, sub public service workers, both in the formal uh, under Public Service Act, formal public servants, provincial and national, but also from municipalities and other parastatals and, and state institutions constitute a huge chunk uh, um, of, of employer contributions. Now, that on, on, on that, uh, and, and, uh, but when you look at the expenditure on the, the smaller portion of the population on the private side, it takes almost 51% of all the expenditure in terms of uh, the, 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 the total health expenditure, uh, only servicing about 15% of the population. Um, now, there is no doubt that that aspect is under huge pressure. Um, high levels of, you know, uh, contributions, both from the members and also from their employers, uh, rising levels of uh, contributions, uh, suffocating what people can can take home for for other ex for other spending, um, notwithstanding the fact that it's already uh, at, at a very high cost. On the other on the other side, the public health, uh, with all the pressure, uh, servicing the huge majority and depending exclusively on on what is allocated from the fiscals. So this is meant to be, as as the uh, presentation indicated. It's an act which is meant to be an equalizer to make sure that, um, you know, the, the huge resources which is uh, used to service a small percentage of people, but also the huge investment uh, in terms of infrastructure, equipment, and human resources in the, in the, in the uh, private uh, uh, side, all that can be pulled together to make sure that um, um, you can have a, a, a one, funding and, and, and the health entity, which, which can pull all those resources and make sure that we can have improvement of services uh, uh, to the large majority, to, to the whole population, let me just say, to the whole population. Now, obviously in terms of 
I mean, to a large population, opening up access, uh, including those resources which uh, the large majority of South Africans are not able to access, will be of a huge benefit. Of course, we are not oblivious of the fact that um, from other components of society, there, there are people who are concerned in terms of the kind of uh, privilege of, especially you know, those of us who have good income and are able to, through the private uh, health insurance, able to access a more you know, uh, private uh, uh, um, uh, facilities, um, but also those who provide the services do have anxiety. Um, now, but I mean, it, it's our view is that we don't have the option in terms of just leaving the status quo because, uh, as I've said, you, you have this two tier. Um, even on the private side, the the high burden on on the, the large majority because the the very high income in the society is a small component. The large majority of people who carry your uh, private sector, private health uh, 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 facilities are actually your middle class, more of your middle income uh, because of the, especially your contribution by the, by the employers. But that is also starting to suffocate uh, both the employers and the employees and, and you get a lot of defaults and that's why even the, the members, the, the primary members of medical schemes has actually been reducing rather than that rather than increasing. So uh, we, we, we believe that um, at the end of the day, through this equalization, even those who are contributing to private insurance will have a relief because we believe that when there is a pooling of resources, the kind of amounts which those who have employment, especially your middle class, contribute to medical schemes, once you can have the pooling and be able to have the single purchaser, which is able to, to use both public and private uh, facilities. And especially in terms of your, your, your private providers be able to negotiate the prices. I think there was a question which came uh, uh, later on, I think it was from uh, uh, Honorable uh, uh, in in terms of the role of private uh, providers, including private hospitals. The, 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 the policy here, as, as we've seen, as we are seeing in countries where your universal health system in one way or another is, is applied, is to make sure that as using uh, the, uh, the kind of size of, of uh, the, the entire population as a purchaser for the entire population, you're able to negotiate better prices and even not even in terms of a user, a, a free a fee for service but in, as, as already indicated in, in, in the presentation, in terms of capitation, uh, where you can have a, a particular service provider for a particular population, but also in terms of other ways of reinvestment, uh, not for uh, a fee for service. So at the end of the day, those, those who are providing, especially your private services, can be, if they won't be forced, but they, 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 there's opportunity for them to service the bigger population and, Many of them, we know that many of your private providers, uh, they've got huge facilities, huge equipment, uh, which are working at about 50%, 60% uh, most of the time, some even at 40%. So they will have an opportunity to can service a bigger population. Of course, with that, it will mean that uh, there has to be a, a better uh, a, a negotiation in terms of how much they get reimbursed in terms of providing those services. So we believe that at the end, this can be a win-win uh, situation. Uh, um, I think that um, uh, Dr. Crisp and others will deal with the issues of registration and IDs, um, whether uh, individuals uh, can be able to, uh, the, 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 as I think already in the presentation in terms of access to services closest to you, that's really the principle in terms of a hierarchy of a referral system. What is key is that each and every person must have at least a primary health facility to which they get their first line of, of, of health services. It can be a, a doctor, the general practitioner. It could be a health service a clinic where also both a, a primary health care nurses and doctors will be able to provide the service. And through that, they, if there's complications, uh, if there are uh, 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 
illnesses which need uh, specialist attention, they will then uh, be able to be referred to those specialist services which are part, which have read, which are contracted to be service providers in you know with, within the NHI. Um, current challenges in terms of uh, infrastructure, a number of um, honourable members have asked that question. Um, the, the reason why uh, it, it quite upfront uh, the, the bill does say also from the white paper that the NHI will be implemented in stages uh, to say that uh, starting from the primary health as a main foundation of providing services and building up up to the highest level is also to, to, to give time uh, um, uh, for the, especially your, your more high burden and uh, a, a public health sector, which needs a lot more investment to give time for, for increased investment and, and, and further improvement, both in terms of infrastructure and equipment. And that's why we also have the Office of the Health Standards and Compliance to, um, uh, to, to actually continue to assess those facilities and indicate on the areas where there is need for, for improvement. And as more and more facilities get ready to can provide secondary and then tertiary services, uh, those, those facilities can then be accredited. And, and that, will in, that will spare the others to come on, on, on board in terms of making sure that they can address. Uh, because you know, if you know that uh, once you can address various shortcomings, you are then able to access, you know, services and 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 be reinvest uh, to can improve further and further. Uh, so the idea, I know that the uh, uh, members, as we're dealing with the national assembly, especially from one of the parties, have been of the view that this will advantage private health. But the the, the approach here is to build incrementally, and and through the office of health standard, identify the shortcomings, especially in the public health and those areas, so that they can be addressed and so that more and more facilities can be able to come on board. Um, I think yeah, th that's just an area which, which I wanted to, to, to deal with. Uh, I'll ask also on, on issues, I know we have dealt with, uh, even when we dealt with the media last week, on the issue of the costing. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, I'll ask uh, Dr. Crisp to, to speak to that. Maybe Chair, just so that we don't take too much time, let me ask, Firstly, uh, Dr. Chris to come in and take a few of those, and then Dr. Tulare and and somewhere I'm sure also the uh, our legal person may may want to come in terms of um, issues of constitutionality, uh, and then whatever is left, uh, uh, myself and the DG can also come in. Uh, Dr. Chris, maybe you can just uh, uh, kick in immediately, and then we can we can uh, come and and, and add on the areas which may still need further in reinforcement. Thank you very much, Minister. So, uh, Honourable Chair and Members, I'll just deal with uh, a few of the practical things first so we get them. So, the question that was raised by the Honourable Latulia about IDs. We know during COVID that we identified around about 3 million people who do not have IDs. The majority of those are South Africans, but there are people who are not South Africans amongst them. And that's why we spoke about biometric identification using fingerprints. But we do have a collaborative with the Department of Home Affairs where we work together to improve the way in which we are able to get people their identities. And we will continue to do that. We have a specific births and deaths uh, collaboration with Home Affairs. It's an ongoing process and it is uh, common in many countries that you don't get everybody. But if we use biometric identifications and single registration numbers, it is uh, very easy to have what we call a portable health record that follows you in the system. I don't want to go into all the technology details, but as far as the registration process is concerned, during COVID, when, or if you go to a doctor or a clinic the first time, you, uh, you fill in a form and you give your name, your ID, or where you live, you might fill in some other information. That's your registration. It's as simple as that. With the NHI system, which is captured on the HPRS, the Health Patient Registration System, you do that only once. You never have to register again. If you are unconscious or unable to speak for any reason and you arrive at a healthcare facility, your fingerprint or your ID document can be used to open your record and understand what is, uh, what is happening with you. So it's not a complicated process at all. It does not exclude anybody. 
And in fact, during COVID, we were able to register a large number of undocumented people using system-generated ID numbers so that they could be vaccinated. Um, so uh, there was also a question for on, from the Honorable Christians about what measures to not exclude the poorest. So the entire uh, NHI is designed to include the poorest. And the phasing process, as the Honorable Minister has just explained, is to deliberately include the, the poorest. And those are often people who only have access to the public health facilities, which may or may not comply with the Office of Health Standards Compliance's uh, certification. So what we are looking at and what we will gazette, eventually it will go for comment, but we can't gazette regulations or anything to do with this until we have an act. But once we do that, we will um, uh, publish for comment a process for systematically in increasing uh, access for people to Office of Health Standards Compliance and other accreditation criteria. This was discussed in the Portfolio Committee. And in fact, there was an amendment made to the bill to include a, a, a conditional registration or accreditation so that we are able to use a phasing in period. But the details need to be worked out uh, and, and published for public comment in due course. As far as tender corruption is concerned, so the National Health Insurance Fund will handle very little by way of tenders. The accreditation is not a tender process. It is a voluntary registration by a service provider, public or private, and as long as they meet the criteria, there's no tender to go out. The prices will be fixed, and the way in which services will be delivered will be fixed and uh, regulated according to what that uh, establishment or provider is able to provide. When it comes to the purchasing of or the procurement process for goods, particularly health products, the fund is only doing the first stage where it is going out like we do at the moment in the national department, where we save billions of rand, by the way, in the process that we do it because of the large volumes that we're able to purchase. And that is a price fixing process. The fund will not actually go about the logistics of purchasing anything. The providers must purchase once those prices are set. So there's, there's far more, less vulnerability in the fund than, uh, than first meets the eye when you look at the bill. As far as the certificate of need is concerned, so this was, the department was taken to court on the, and this has nothing to do with the NHI bill. It is in the National Health Act, sections 36 to 40 were challenged in the court. The department, unfortunately, was not informed and did not uh, represent itself. So there's been a rescission hearing and the judgment has been handed down and uh, it has been in favor of the department. So now we will be able to deal with this for once and for all. There are already provisions in the Pharmacy Act and other places for pharmacies to comply with certificates of need. And there are many other examples of this in our society where you can't just open a school or a bottle store or various other things at any place you want, and it's deliberate for planning. And in the health market inquiry, there was a, a very strong motivation for a supply side regulator to make sure that we get facilities in appropriate places and not just higgledy-piggledy. So we agree with all of those things and those will be functions of the fund. So we're not uh, too perturbed about that right now. We will deal with this as the cases arise. Regarding the constantly asked question about feasibility study, this has been discussed and published and presented by us many times over the years, starting in 2012 in the white paper when a costing was done and published and it's in the white paper. There have also been many discussion papers by various academics, the Actuarial Society and others that have all been published. There's a, a guidance, strong guidance, again reiterated on the 12th of December last year at the UHC conference from the World Health Organization that it is ill-advised to try and do a detailed costing of this kind of reform and no other country has done it. What you do is you do it in incrementally and you set the, the target within which you are going to design and manage your system and you only introduce the benefits that you know you can afford within that envelope. But you, we, are, we can refer you to the, the honorable members to those various studies that have been done and comments that have been made. They are, you will see they're very wide in range because there's no agreed global methodology for doing this. As far as the um, infrastructure and service delivery budgets are at the moment, 
we would agree that this is not reasonable to continue to cut the health budget every year. And we would appeal to the members of parliament to support us that when these budgets arrive in parliament, don't approve them. Request that they be increased so that we protect our health services. It doesn't help that we continue to approve redu reduced budgets. And then we complain that we're not able to fill posts and fix the infrastructure that we have. We really do need to protect what we've got. And uh, that is... Uh, within the, the, the 10 health budgets we have, the nine provincial and the national budgets, but uh, there's a limit to what is possible in the immediate term. Uh, as far as the accreditation of providers are concerned, I've uh, sort of uh, alluded to that. We don't want a situation where we exclude any provider. So like we have done in the past with other things, you introduce these gradually. When the National Laboratory Service was uh, established, the accreditation of laboratories took several years. So you start with conditional uh, accreditation and then slowly but surely strengthen and strengthen until you've got internationally accredited laboratories. It's an expensive process, so you have to do it quite slowly. We don't need to have inspectors. Much of this can be done by first self-assessments and then by peer assessments, and only those that are already ready can be uh, physically inspected by objective inspection mechanisms and accreditation mechanisms. So I think we should uh, be practical. Uh, what we are trying to do is find solutions here and make sure that everybody is included in this. As far as the provincial powers are concerned, um, the acts of parliament are acts of parliament and they are created in terms of provisions of the constitution. And I'm sure Advocate Mabella can add to this, but it is parliament that amends acts. And uh, this uh, bill proposes amendments to that act, the National Health Act, which assigns the functions to provinces, to national and elsewhere. And so if this act with the amendments in section in Schedule 1 is adopted, then it means we will reassign the functions of the various role players. So we don't believe that it's a constitutional issue at all. It's a legislative mandate and a responsibility of the minister in the Health Act to ensure that the functions are appropriately provided. Um, the onboarding of everybody, including district health managers, is a systematic process. So we have been working at this stage with the provincial departments and the heads of departments in the beginning to go through the practical impl implementations. And we've recently had a two-day workshop where a lot of questions could be asked and people, people could engage with the details now that the bill is becoming a reality and is well on its way and, and in the process. What we will are now doing is the provinces, the provincial departments will organize their various uh, sessions for their head offices, their district managers, and so forth. So it is an education process, and it will take some time for everybody to get on board. Sorry, there was also a question about protection of personal information. We are very rigid about this. We have been uh, audited repeatedly during COVID on our various data systems. We continue to be audited by the Auditor General. And we, are, we believe that the systems that are in place are very rigorous. One has to uh, continue to be very vigilant about this. In healthcare in particular, this is private, personal, medical information, and health records are very private. So we agree completely, and we have a whole uh, section that, that deals with this every time we are working with personal information. Um, there were questions asked about uh, from the Honourable and Chabi Ling about where will the funds come from. And I think the Honourable Minister has covered it. But just to say that the, the complexity of the current system is that the money is all over the place. Even in the public sector, the money that is used for purchasing health services is in 10 different government departments for health, plus the correctional services and the defence force, and in the Road Accident Fund, and in the Competition Commission. I mean, Compensation Commission. So even in the public sector, it's complicated. Bits and pieces of the money that are used to purchase healthcare services need to be moved into the fund according to where they are and what the statutory provisions are systematically and slowly so as not to break the system. But we do spend a, a huge amount of money on healthcare in this country. And unfortunately, large amounts of it are spent in duplication, unnecessary administration because of the complexity of the system, and of course in both public and private sectors on fraud and corruption. 
So we believe there's more than enough money in the system and it will take time to redirect it. Will we close private facilities? No, absolutely. The private healthcare facilities are a critical and cardinal part of the resources of the health system of the country. Two thirds of all the medical specialists in this country work in the private sector and 90% of the dentists are in the private sector. It would not be a good idea at all to close them. But what we do want to do is make sure that we limit what they charge and how they are paid. So uh, there was the next question was, is there a cap on what practitioners can charge? The answer is very definitely yes. And the fund will be purchasing. So the you and I, as the user of the service and any other member of the public, will not pay a cent at the point of contact. That's the whole point of an insurance system is you pay in advance. We're pooling our money, as the Honorable Minister said, into one common pool. And uh, we are making sure that our personal uh, needs are dealt with at the time of our individual risk. Of course, that money is not deposited in the account and sits there as billions of rand. It comes in on, in weekly tranches, like it does now with government departments, and it is going out on a daily basis paying to providers. So there's never huge sums of money that are sitting in a bank account somewhere. This is the, pretty similar to how once, uh, the Treasury works and how the provincial treasuries will work. And it's uh, like all public entities, they don't get lump sum of money that sits in a bank account waiting to be spent. Do we have a practical plan? The Honorable Bacha asked a practical plan for funding modalities. Yes, in fact, we do have a practical plan. And we understand that systematically working from the low hanging fruit of conditional grants to the provincial equitable share through the, as the minister mentioned, the, the uh, the money that the 40 billion that the state currently contributes to the 1.2 million public servants medical schemes plus et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There are very different sources and we do understand where they are and we do know that they have to be moved. Um, we have definitely engaged with many private providers and establishments and uh, individuals during the course of pre-COVID, COVID and now since COVID. And I must say, it's, it's obviously a mixed bag. There are some who feel threatened and who don't like what is what they hear. There are many who don't necessarily understand and are hearing uh, disinformation in the public space. But uh, overall, particularly in the big hospital environment, we have not had negative comments. It's mostly positive comments with some concerns for discussion. We meet with the pharmaceutical industry regularly through a big committee, a big a grouping called the Pharmaceutical Task Group. Uh, and we meet with laboratories and other providers of services. And it has not been negative. We do know that the funders are anxious. And we have seen the negative comments in the media space from the funders. Uh, and that's uh, a very obvious why they are more negative than the providers. Uh, perhaps I'll just make one last comment uh, because the Honourable Lehili um, from the EFF mentioned about will the unemployed be able to make monthly payments? So the unemployed will not make any payments. There's no payment. Uh, you, if you are unemployed and have no income or even a grant and you are buying goods, you are contributing through VAT and other taxes. Uh, every time you get in a vehicle or a taxi, you are contributing through the, the taxes that are collected through that mechanism. You don't have to pay anything else. So every person who lives in this country unavoidably pays some form of tax. That's, uh, and if you are wealthy, you are middle class, you will pay more tax. And uh, if you are very poor and unemployed, you don't have to pay tax. So there's no monthly payment to be made by these people. And the last comment I think I should make is around the foreigners. Yes, the foreign people I mentioned when I, when I made the presentation on the bill may uh, access the health services, but it is specified which foreigners may access which services. And if you are legally in this country and you are legally part of the operations of the society in this country, that means you are paying tax anyway, then yes, you will benefit from the provisions of this. But for those who are illegally here, the bill provides that the fund must pay for emergency services. And because we are a, a civilized nation, we will look after all children. And the bill specifically must pay for the health care of all children. 
So I, I hopefully I've dealt, Minister, with uh, a lot of the questions. I know I haven't got to everything. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, um, maybe just uh, one of the issues which was raised by Honorable Christians uh, about uh, ministerial overreach. Uh, and let me just say that uh, uh, this refers to, in the act, any other person uh, in our constitutional system who gets appointed uh, in the position of a minister. Um, and the question, this has been quite a hot discussion even through the process in the National Assembly. Um, and there were proposals from some of the parties that the, the appointment of the, of the NHI fund a board and the CEO, uh, well, at least the board uh, should be by a parliament and uh, then that board can appoint a CEO. Now, uh, th that's a matter which uh, I know that, uh, you know, it, during the course of this uh, within the assembly, but even before that, uh, even in the, in the early period of, of just the public comments before the bill, when it uh, was approved by by um, uh, cabinet, uh, that issue has already been discussed, and cabinet before approving the bill to be uh, you know uh, 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 tabled in parliament had looked at that, and while there was some ele element of sympathy to say maybe in terms of uh, you know public ownership, but the fear there, honourable members, was also that. Just looking at the example of um, a body like uh, the South African Broadcasting Corporation, um, where the board of that body is appointed in parliament, uh, it becomes quite a subject of political uh, kind of, you know, uh, machinations in one way or another. Um, and sometimes it ends up, you know, paralyzed. And, and the question was, for a for an uh, institution like this, which provides services, uh, which fund which looked at uh, for a, a part of, you know managing the funds for basic services, do you want that kind of a board to be stuck uh, in terms of the balance of uh, forces in parliament, uh, you know, and can get paralyzed in in that uh, process, and and the final uh, decision therefore was that rather. The, uh, it, the minister should appoint uh, after uh, approval by cabinet. Uh, so, but I'm, I'm aware that uh, other members within our legislature are still not happy with that. But uh, I think as you look at that, consider the risk as well of a situation where a board of a body like this can then be stuck in terms of a, a, a whatever kind of, you know, tussling which which you know parliament is a political body and 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 whether we want a body like this uh, but i'm sure the the the, the, the ncop will also uh, make certain you know discussions in terms of this um but uh, the, it, it, this will be subjected to a public scrutiny uh, in terms of because according to to this the, the members of, of the board will also be subject to public nomination. Uh, it will be a very transparent uh, process, and, but also making sure that those members do possess relevant skills to can be able to oversee uh, a function like this. Um, and, and also making sure that this body uh, should, be the, the board itself should then recommend a, a, a CEO who's competent and all other, and once that is done, that board then takes responsibility for the rest of the executive uh, uh, management. Um, the issue of whether somebody can choose their medical schemes, the, the, as you would see, the, the, the bill makes provision that incrementally the NHI fund, as it gets stronger, should cover more and more service package. And as it covers a particular service, that a, a private a scheme should only cover the, the services which are not covered, because otherwise the, the ability to negotiate uh, particular services will then collapse if, if, 
if the same package, if, if the NHI covers all maternity services, including theater for cesarean section, normal labor, and then at the same time, uh, individual private schemes also cover maternity services, and then on what basis would the, the National Health Insurance be able to get a better package of, of, of cost in terms of uh, negotiating with service providers if it is competing with uh, 10 or uh, in the current situation, uh, 70 other uh, private uh, uh, funders or pri yeah, private uh, insurance, then, then that, that would not be. Um, in terms of the, as a NCOP, obviously very, very much uh, 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 constituted of, of provincial uh, legislators as well. Um, there, there, is, there will continue to be, you know, as we know, health is a concurrent uh, function. There will continue to be uh, certain responsibilities in terms of the services uh, at the provincial level. Um, and those in terms of this uh, act will be further negotiated between the national and, and provincials in terms of the particular areas which will be continue to be the, 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 the responsibility in terms of management and, and actual provision of service. Uh, also contracted to the to the national health insurance. Those issues, um, in terms of the current, some of those are, are quite uh, detailed, uh, including emergency services and so on within the end. But others will be a subject of discussion and and and, and negotiation uh, in terms of uh, those functions, which will continue to be to be uh, uh, managed uh, and provided for at the at the provincial level. Uh, the details, I'm sure in terms of complaints, procedures, um, uh, I, I'm sure we, we, we are aware that an act like this cannot take care of all those details, but um, uh, there is a, 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 an overall high level provision, but the details will, will be covered in terms of the, 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 the regulations. Um, in terms of workforce retention and lessons learned, of course we are learning from the experience of not only the National Health Service in, in the UK, uh, its, its strength and its challenges, but all over. There are a number of other countries with a slightly different models. And we're also looking at the, the lessons learned from those so that at the implementation level, all those can be brought into, into a, a, a kind of consideration. Um, the, as I said, the, in terms of workforce, I mean, as, 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 as Dr. Crisp has already mentioned, some of the workforce will be those who are, I mean, within the public health services um, under the Public Service Act, but also a number of opportunities for private providers, GPs, physiotherapists, dentists, and even um, specialists and, and, and all sorts of private providers. But of course, there will be those who currently are really, uh, you know, earning exorbitant income because of the current fee for service where you can, you know, providers can close their eyes and just call a price, uh, which, which increasingly that will not be uh, uh, um, available, but there will be work and, and there will be certainty because once you are a service provider, you are registered, you will have a certainty that this is the, uh, the population, in, uh, the, um, this is the services which I'm contracted to supply and you will be able to be reimbursed. Uh, so, so of course, as I've said, those who are uh, really claiming it, uh, smiling all the way to the bank, some may feel uh, threatened at the current moment. Um, th 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 there might be other areas, uh, issues of uh, constitutionality. I don't know if Advocate uh, uh, Muavelo may want to come in. I think this has been uh, a major issue uh, during the course of the National Assembly. And uh, also from Dr. Tulari, if there might be other areas which have been left out. I know we don't have a lot of time left. Um, if, if any of uh, DG, maybe through your coordination, if, if there are any other, uh, uh, I thought there might be some areas where an um, uh, advocate might want to come in, maybe also Dr. Tulare. Uh, let, me, let me ask the DG just to coordinate any further input from the colleagues in the, in the department. DG. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister, uh, uh, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members. Uh, may I request Dr. Tulare just to fill in any gaps uh, from what uh, uh, Professor Crisp uh, actually comprehensively addressed. Dr. T? 
Uh, good morning, Honorable Chairperson and Honorable Members of uh, the Select Committee. Morning, Minister and DG. Uh, Dr. Chris has uh, provided a comprehensive response. I just wanted to add one thing on uh, the issue of choice and the role of medical schemes. That as uh, this uh, bill was developed, uh, there were lots of uh, studies that were undertaken to understand what happens in other contexts. And I want to give some examples that, for example, if you look at what is happening in France, where they've got a national health insurance, what is not covered by the national health insurance is covered by what, what, what they call mutuals. So Section 33 of uh, the National Health Insurance Bill makes provision for uh, medical schemes to cover what is not reimbursable by the NHI, similar to what is happening in contexts such as uh, France and in Canada, actually, where we also studied and where a lot of our health professionals migrate to. We know that all the provinces in Canada do not allow for a uh, supplementarity. Uh, there's no complementary uh, insurance other than the National Health Insurance of Canada, except in Quebec, in the province of Quebec, where they allow that. And so uh, the decision on how uh, Section 33 is structured is to ensure that we can pull so that everyone is covered and we maximize uh, the pooling to ensure that services are extended to cover everybody, irrespective of where they come from, whether they are rich or poor, they are going to be covered by that. And then I just wanted to compliment also on a response that was provided in terms of the complaints and procedures, complaints procedures that should be independent of the minister. And uh, I think, you know, just to clarify that, you know, the bill has made provision for internal complaints mechanisms inside the fund, a tribunal that has got a, a status of a court. Uh, we have the health ombuds, uh, who uh, the public is also at liberty to complain to. And we also have other section nine institutions that uh, uh, can be used uh, to complain. So, uh, and also uh, the health professions council, if you are unhappy with uh, your provider, there is that route also for complaining, uh, uh, which uh, is not directly you know, uh, related to how the minister is exercising his authority, even though uh, some of the institutions are counting uh, to the minister. And in terms of time timeframes for implementing NHI, we have outlined uh, in uh, the section on transitional arrangements that NHI is going to be implemented over phases and uh, the phases that have been articulated in uh, the section on transitional arrangements indicate that we are looking at a time horizon of up to 2020, 2029, where we expect that by that time, uh, we would have implemented fully uh, what uh, we intend to do. And uh, yes, uh, DG and Minister, I think uh, that's all that I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tulare. May I, uh, uh, through the indulgence of the chair and the members, invite Advocate Moabelo on legal and constitutional uh, issues. Advocate Moabelo. Uh, good morning, uh, Minister, uh, honorable members of the select committee. Uh, good morning, DG. I'm going to deal with only two issues relating to the constitutional matters. It is the issue relating to section 36 to 40 of the act that was declared to be unconstitutional by the court. But luckily, uh, the department approached the court to apply for rescission of the decision because uh, the court took a decision. Uh, there was a default judgment, meaning the judgment was, was made without uh, the department presenting its side. So because of that decision, now the, the section 36 to 40 are still valid and part of the National Health Act. But the department will now have an opportunity to present uh, its own side of the story to the court before the court can then take a decision. Meaning the matter is not over. It is still going back to court for both parties, uh, for the court to hear both parties so that they can take a decision. But because this is a constitutional matter, even if the High Court uh, still take a decision that Section 36 to 40 are unconstitutional, they will still have to take the matter to Constitutional Court for Constitutional Court to confirm that those decisions, uh, the sections are constitutional or not. And the court may say 
this is unconstitutional, but you, you, you may have to change this one and this one, then the court will give, normally the court will give the, uh, the government two years to uh, uh, do the amendment. In relation to the constitutionality of the, uh, the National Health Insurance Bill, the one that has been passed by the National Assembly, the, the state law advisor and the department scrutinized the bill during the preparation period before it could even be submitted to cabinet to check the constitutionality and it was found to be constitutional. The, the amendment relating to other acts uh, which are now contained in the schedule to the, to the bill are constitutional and are valid. That's how uh, uh, parliament amend other act that are not uh, the uh, help, that that are that are not part of that act. For example, now because we are coming with the new law altogether, but we want this law to amend various other acts. That is usually done through uh, the schedules attached to the act. So we are amending a lot of uh, national health act uh, sections. Uh, the Odingwa Act also is being amended there as well. So those sections are valid and uh, should be processed as such through the NCOP. Of course, in South Africa, any person has got, an has got a right to challenge the constitutionality of uh, the act that has been passed by parliament. And it's only the constitutional court that can take a decision that this, uh, this act or particular sections of the act are unconstitutional and may then uh, issue a deliberately order. Thank you very much, DG and Minister. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Advocate. Just to clarify, the first part that the Advocate spoke to, uh, 36, Section 36 to 40 is of the National Health Act. That's the one that deals with the certificate of need. Um, and then he just used acronyms, or DIMWA, that's Occupational Diseases in Mines and Works Act um, that he was referring to. Uh, Minister, uh, I will hand back to the Minister. I think we've covered uh, all the parts. Uh, thank you very much, Minister. Well, thank you, DG. Back to you, uh, Honorable Chair. Sorry, we might have taken too much time, but back to you uh, from our side. Uh, we tried our best. I know that uh, some of the members uh, may not be satisfied that uh, we've dealt in detail, but I'm sure there will be more opportunity uh, for further engagement between your committee and our team. Thank you very much. I'm sure this is not the last time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister. And um, uh, Honorable Minister, um, um, I think on behalf of the Select Committee, we want to thank you very, very much for a very detailed overview on the NHI uh, deal and also the passing of the bill at the National Assembly and now being referred to the National Council of Provinces. Um, and also to thank the department um, on also a very detailed uh, briefing to the committee and um, also the engagement of the members. And uh, that we believe that members have engaged in large or at large on the clarities and questions from the briefing yeah. and um, the legal part was also very well covered in terms of the legalities and also the legislative matters and uh, what we left with now is the way forward uh, which are the four steps of the national council of provinces as how we're going to move forward with this bill which uh, as I've said earlier, the bill is a six-week uh, cycle, and then the, the, the next step is provincial briefings, will be provincial briefings, public hearings in the provinces, as call for written submission in the, in, in the coming weeks. Finally, is also the finalization of the time frame, the Council of Provinces will be in up to October 2023. So that is how we're going to unfold this process. And uh, without any, I, I don't think there is, will be any further. Um, as the minister has said, that it will not be the last time that we're engaging. We are, this is a process. 
and then we will take ourselves in confident uh, on this process and to make sure at the end that we provide a healthy community for South Africa through uh, effective and efficient legislative to ensure that nobody is going to uh, suffer health, but we will have a good community and a healthy community. I think without uh, any further ado, um, that we come to the end of this meeting and then to thank the minister again once more. Thank you very much, minister, and to all the stakeholders and all members of the committee, provincial chairs, uh, the, thank you, thank you very, very, very much. And uh, we will now excuse the department and the minister, and then we will go to the internal matters of the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Minister. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you very much, uh, honorable members. Uh, draft minutes, we are having our draft minutes of the 16th of May, 2023. And we go through in terms of attendance of members. The next one, attendance of provincial legislatures. Can we move on? Um, legislatures. Uh, Support staff, uh, ministry, department of departmental, and uh, adoption of the agenda, deliberations, uh, responses, uh, consideration by the chairperson, and it was then the adjournment of the meeting was then adjourned by eleven thirty. That is, those are the minutes, uh, members. Can we get any proposal for the, the adoption of those minutes? I move for the adoption any of the minutes, Chair, as true reflection. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable uh, Kossi. I'm um, seconding, Second, Honorable Kossi. Second, I'm seconding, Thank Honorable Kossi. Thank you very much, Honorable Chabale. The uh, next matter, uh, Marcel. Okay. This, the next matter will be the, the policy assessment uh, recommendations report yes. of the support of the select committee on health social services on the annual uh, performance. Can we move on? This is the draft. Can we come? just come back again? Uh, it's a draft that needs to be adopted. Can we move on? Okay, we can move on. Move on. Then move on. Conclusion. Okay. There is the report, members. Uh, can we get a proposal for the adoption of this report? Yes. Proposal for the adoption of the report? I move that uh, we adopt this report, sir, person. That's uh, Chabale. Thank you, Honorable Chabale. Uh, report. Uh, any second? Uh? This is dated the 20th of second. June, 2023. I'm Pardon? second, Honorable Chair. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Nkosi. Uh, okay, that is, any further matter, uh, Michelle? Okay. 
Any further matter? Okay, the draft third term program for the select committee on health and social uh, services. Those are the dates, uh, members, uh, for the, the, the draft uh, program, the third term. We actually, this week, we uh, are having our last meeting for the second term. So now we're gonna move to the third term. So those are the, that, this is the draft uh, program that we have to approve. Can we move on? Okay, constituency period. Uh, there is a constituency period in... Okay, members, can we have a proposal for the uh, approval or, of the program? Uh, I move, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Chabaleng. Chabaleng, uh, second. Are you there, I'm Honorable there. Dongeni? Hello. Who's seconding? Any member to second? Any member to second? I second. Don't me second. Okay, Honorable Dongeni, yeah, thank you. I, no, no. Thank no. you for seconding. Um, I think that was the last matter. If any, uh, chairperson, excuse me, chairperson, Marcelia. Okay. Chairperson, I thought we could also adopt the fourth term program because the third term is so short. Our fourth term naturally follows the process of the National Health Insurance Bill. So I thought it would be advisable that we adopt this program as well, Chair. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, members, that, there we have the fourth term. Yeah, because of the continuity of the two pro programs is going to move into each other. Um, can we move on? Can move on? Yeah. Okay. Uh Okay, that is the last part. Any uh, proposal for adoption? Approval of the uh, program? I move for yeah, the uh, proposed. Okay, Honorable Kosi, thank you very much. Uh, second. Chabaleng, second. I second, Honorable Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Honorable, let me take Honorable Nsugube for seconding. Okay, thank you, honorable members. Yes, I think that was now the last one uh, matter that we have for today. May, and may then I, that may, we also say. May today, I ask uh, yes, honorable um, Chabalen, you may come in. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just wanted to take if there's any briefing about the about our about our uh, trip. If there is any yes. new briefing or any new information or what is outstanding, if there's any outstanding thing. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Chabaleng, for that. Uh, it will assist that we have uh, information at the same uh, page. Um, Michelle, can you take us through? Thank you, Chair. Yes, Chairperson, of course. Um, as I have indicated um, previously on our uh, chat, um, we are currently in the stage of submitting financials. It's quite a tedious process. There are various signatures that have to be attached, but um, our application is in process, Chair. Um, we have also um, been in contact with the Embassy. They are finalizing our program um, in terms of required documents. Uh, we do have um, our COVID certificate that I'd ask members to um, apply for. It's a, a link that you click and then it gives you your COVID certificate. Um, also, we will need uh, to do our visas three days before departure. I will send out a link 
closer to the times of next week sometime Chelsea will send out the link for the visa process like i say we're going to do it online you'll pay for your own visa it's around about 150 rand and we will then all of us claim back that 150 rand from parliament so currently chairperson that is where we are at i will keep everyone informed as and to the information becomes more apparent thank you chair Thank you very much, uh, Michelle. Um, yeah, we all on that uh, process is ongoing. But if there's any, 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 any emergency, we will, if possible, but we, uh, as Michelle is informing us regularly, if there's anything that we we'll need that we have to engage, um, we will do that. But uh, we, 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 we move on the uh, unfolding. How is the Honorable Chabadang, is your hand up? Yeah, I just wanted to check uh, with, the, with the COVID certificates. Do we send them to you or we need to print them when we leave in case that we need them at the airport? Thank you, Mr. Chabadang. Mr. Chabadang, I prefer to have a copy if you don't mind. But if you can also keep a copy on your phone, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Sorry, any further clarity? Sorry, yes, Chair. Honorable, Honorable Dongeni. Okay. I just want to know what time we should be in Jobek. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Ms. Ndongeni. Our flights are scheduled for half past two on Friday, the 30th of June. I had said, I had indicated earlier that, um, I mean, on the group chat, that our flights were all fully booked for the Saturday because we initially we were supposed to leave on the 1st. We've um, received flights for the 30th, which is Friday, Friday the 30th at half past two in the afternoon. That is the flight to Addis. We will fly from Johannesburg to Addis and then from Addis on to Seoul and return the same way. So it would be Friday at um, the 30th of June, around about half past two. I will send all of those details out, members, closer to the time. I just don't want to send anything out before our financials are approved in case things change. But I have all the flight details. Um, hotels, all of those details I do have. I'm just waiting for our financials to be approved so that I can send those details out. Also, the travel agent will individually message each member with all of those details. And of course, I will send it out as well. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Michelle. I think just a uh, just, uh, smaller Yana one also, the returning flight, okay, you will provide us now just to have an understanding as to uh, will it be the Saturday the 8th back in the morning or afternoon? Chair, I'll provide all of those details. It's definitely the 8th. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, thank you very much, uh, members. Uh, I think we have got... Uh, Honorable Jabalang, I see your hand is still up. Oh, no, it's a historical one. Okay, okay. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, members. Thank you very much, Michelle, for those detailed uh, clarities. Yes, and I think uh, our meeting have come to an end. And thank you very, very much, uh, members. And uh, have a good day going further. And thank you very much. Thanks, Chair.